Good evening, everybody. This is Rob with another edition of Horror Pop After Midnight, and my guest is Chris Daytone. How's it going, Chris? It's going great. I appreciate you having me. I've been looking forward to it. Same here. Um, it was great meeting you at the Past Film Festival. Yeah, the showcase of uh, Average Joe's work. They do phenomenal stuff. It was it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it, it. I mean, it was great. Um, I loved um, all of his indie shorts. I mean, you know, uh, Revolver was pretty good, which I liked. But um, I liked uh, Justice, though. That was just a very, you know, powerful, you know, like short film. So, so uh, this past weekend, you were working on a film too. Can you talk about that? Uh, to an extent, yeah. I'll, I'll happily tell you what I what I can walk up to without without giving anything away okay some trouble but uh this is the first feature done by another local studio called brave runner studios helmed by naeem david and karen shawnee and i've been working with them on and off on shorts since 2017 when i'm when i moved back from pittsburgh uh oh. the first one we did together was entitled dilemma and he had me play in one of my first villain roles and i really that one that one got traction a lot of people watched the the climactic scene at the end and wow, this is a really great villain, which kind of led to me being typecast for a little bit. But uh, in this one, uh, fortunately, I play a character by the name of Peter Savage, who's a retired police officer, uh, looking after his best friend's daughter, who has just become an author and is dealing with the consequences of having had a stalker for a lot more years than she is, uh, well, let's just say comfortable with. And we have one day left before we're raft, which is crazy because it feels like we just started this. And I mean, when when you're working on a crew that, that has nothing but people that you love in every direction, it, it's, it's going to go fast, but it, it literally feels like we started it yesterday. I'm looking forward to seeing it when it pops up. Is it going to be popping up at like at film festivals? Yeah. Naeem is actually already talking about how he wants to distro it. There are a few companies that have ends with streaming services that he's talking to, as well as he wants to pair it with another feature and do very, very much in, in the veins of, uh, joe's showcase uh, for some reason he doesn't believe that anybody would want to come and see the shorts and i'm like well we i think we just proved that that is not the case but i mean it's your work i'm not going to pressure you but at the same time you've got some great stuff here um i know we were talking prior to the interview i told you there are more than a few independent studios that i put on the same tier as as average joe's uh but with joe cox's level of marketing and confidence he ends up sh- outshining a good majority of them if these people took the same level of opportunity to, to showcase their work. I think Cincinnati could be a real a hub for film, not even just indie film. I can see it. Um, lately it, Cincinnati has been eyed on by Hollywood. I mean, there's been like a lot of big actors. I mean, Bruce Willis, uh, Emilio Estevez. I mean, there's all kinds of, you know, blockbuster movies that was also shot in Cincinnati too. I didn't say it, but De Niro is here currently filming, uh, wise guys which being an Italian actor, I'm like, you know, that kind of thing. (laughs) Yeah. I heard about De Niro's doing a film here in Cincinnati, which is pretty cool. They're also doing another film here in Cincinnati, um, as well. Um, going around called bike riders with a Norman Reedus and the young actor who was in the latest Elvis movie. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I caught that. That was, uh, a pretty phenomenal recreation of his life. Um, they left out certain copyright entanglements with some of his songs, but I mean, I'm, I can understand why they do that in this day and age. It's not really going to be helping anybody. <laughs> but that said, it was still a phenomenal picture. Um, you were also in a film uh, starring opposite of an Emmy winner. Who was that? That was the rather phenomenal Justin Shinkaro, who I have been watching on Nickelodeon since I was like seven. Uh, if you're familiar with Hey Arnold at all, yes, he played Harold, which was Arnold, Arnold's bully. I'm going to pound you, that guy. Um, he's also done work with Disney Plus on my son's favorite kid's show, Spidey and His Amazing Friends. Uh, he was in Erie, Indiana. The, the man's just prolific, and it was a, a dream come true to work with him. I'm happy to say he's every bit as awesome as I hoped he would be. And I'm looking forward to the premiere, which is actually in February for that. It's called Live, Laugh, Die. Uh, put forward by what was True North Productions is now the Cliff Productions out of Kentucky, which is another phenomenal company, helmed by a good friend of mine, Chris Gatrost, who 
he's got another two coming down the pipeline as we speak, so I would watch out for that as well. I definitely have to go check that out. That seems good. So when you were working with him on the set, did you learn anything from him? Oh, absolutely. He's got a really interesting process as far as getting himself, especially into the darker head spaces. Uh, he plays a very, very creepy character in this one without me going too much further. Yeah. He, and it, it is so, so the opposite of every bit of personality he showcases between takes. He's warm and open and happy, and, you know, he, he inputs on every discussion and then you hit action and it's like he's slipping a white switch. He, he becomes a complete, and I mean, obviously that's the goal as an actor, but he becomes a completely different person at the drop of a dime. And the main lesson he told me about it, the main thing that he mentioned was to, to truly separate yourself from the character, just to use your empathy to try and understand them as though they were another person and put yourself in their shoes. And I've basically been doing that my whole life just in order to interact with polite society. So <laughs> it helps a lot to hear him say that. So, um, so what do you think about uh, independent cinema? Do you think independent cinema is going to end up saving, you know, films and movie theaters? today it wouldn't be the first time i mean back in the golden age of hollywood when studios would literally own actors based on the level of commitment in their contracts you would have these cinemas running independent projects that when when this when the, the studios weren't sending their films to these theaters because of them not meeting the bundling costs and, and various things they were just sitting empty so they would showcase work that you genuinely couldn't see anywhere else from up-and-coming talent that didn't have those entanglements to the, uh, honestly, it was a cesspool. And, and at the time it, it may have gotten better since then, but the vestiges of that trauma still remain in Hollywood. People, people try to think of the golden age as a long time ago, much like world war two. It wasn't like we're less than a hundred years removed from these people essentially being glamorized indentured servitude. Um, so I think with streaming coming up and main works, not even, they're skipping right over theaters to save production costs. I think cinemas are going to basically have to turn to independent creators. And it'll probably be the third time throughout the course of cinema history that we have, you know, sort of grabbed them out of their descent and pulled them back up into a, a viable business. And if anything, you know, Joe's event definitely gives me hope that that's possible. Uh, the turnout there was phenomenal. Have people walk in from, you know, from outside the community that they quite literally just wanted to come and see the films it was really heartening. I, I hope so. <laughs> hey, that's good because um, I think you know indie, indie films are on fire because um, there's a lot of indie films getting um, noticed too, and you know, um, you know, popping it's gonna be start popping up in the mainstream. You know, like a good example, Terrifier Two. That was just a you know a independent horror film, and you know, and uh, Damon Leone who you know wrote it, directed, and created it. You know, didn't think his, you know, that film was going to be shown on the big screen and it got out there and it was, it ended up being phenomenal. Everybody is still talking about it. And this was like a basic indie film. This wasn't like a film that was filmed at a Hollywood studio. Yeah, I think the trick with indie film is to just never showcase that it's independent until the end. And then you gauge people's faces. If they look surprised, then you did a good job. And that's kind of the metric I use for independent studios all over here, all, all over Pittsburgh. If you can view the work from an independent studio completely out of context and go, oh, wow, who did that? What, what studio did that? Much like Joe's, much like Naeem's work, much like my friend Paul out of Pittsburgh. If you, if you can look at these, this work and go, I'm not sure what budget that had, then you've succeeded as an indie director. Like you, The goal is to dance around that high production value without having the budget because ultimately it takes more creativity to do stuff like this without piles and piles of money. So I think it, I think it's where it's at because right now, in my opinion, Hollywood doesn't have any original ideas at all. My experience when I first started acting, the first role I ever had was, was a bit of extra work on mind Hunter on Netflix. That they filmed the first season of in 2016. And I spent the first day on set playing a crime scene reporter before makeup pulled me into the into their little area. Uh, and in walks Jonathan Groff. And, and, and after that, I, I spent the whole year being stand-in. So I got to look really closely at what directors like David Fincher do on set. I remember our first night we were out there, it was 
freezing and it was in the middle of like spitting rain but uh mr fincher believed that the roads were not quite wet enough so we had to stand there with our antique cameras and 70s attire yeah. while he brought in water trucks to saturate the set like that's that's that kind of thing is just not an option on indie films you have to wait for the right day if you're looking for a soaked texture you literally have to have everybody ready to go when the weather cooperates because you can't bring in 500,000 gallons of water to just spray everything down with. so when you see studios accomplish stuff like uh, I know we were talking about Analog Rainbow and, and Joe's work and everything like that when you see studios pull off that kind of thing without the budget it's it's all the more impressive to me honestly I think so too because it takes a lot of you know dedication and planning and all that and um, certain indie films out there you can tell um, you know, the writer and director, um, they put their heart and soul into it to make that great film to get the, you know, film goer to get them interested in the story, like the characters, you know, the cinematography, the music, which, you know, brings it into the movie to get that, just get them right in there. And then once you do that, then once they're sold and bought, you're going to have one good film. Exactly. And I, I mean, it comes down to every element. You have to care about all of it, even down to color grading. I love the way that uh, when Joe had Rise of Elsie Matthews edited, it looks almost like everything is bathed in sunset, regardless of what time of day it is. Yeah. And it, it, it kind of shows the showcase, and without too many spoilers, it showcases the twilight of the relationship between two very prominent characters in that film. Uh, to have it look so late in the day, if that makes any sense. Like To me, that was a, a piece of artistic brilliance. It, I've never actually told Joe that, but hopefully he watches this and sees it. Oh, I hope I hope he does. I mean, I hope he does too. And his other short film he did, uh, Justice, was uh, pretty good with a young, talented actress, Miss Botkin. Yes, Callie, she's phenomenal. And while I wasn't in that one, I I make a point to watch every one of Joe's shorts. Uh-huh. Uh, I also make a point make a point to send him a message, lightly making fun of him when he doesn't cast me and stuff. But he's like, look. If I used you every time, people would get sick of seeing you. I'm like, you're probably right, but ow, you know that kind of thing. <laughs> well, that's yeah. tr- that's true, but there's um, a lot of directors and writers on um, films that use the same actors in their movies. I can give you several examples: Tarantino, Adam Sandler. Um, yeah, they all use the same actors. I mean, you know, in the different films, and and it. And it's best that way because the actors are so comfortable around each other. They can play off each other like in certain scenes, which I think... You build a a real-life relationship with people. The the dynamic gets better and better the more time you spend with people between takes, which ultimately results in a better take pretty much every time. Um, It was was mostly people I hadn't worked with before on on this newest one, Cruel. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. and the dynamic is definitely still there, but you can tell, you can almost tell we get more comfortable with each other as time has gone on. Like they were staples in the community when I met them. Now I consider them friends. So, I and mean, it's a lot easier to work with friends. So, um, how long um, were you uh, working and being part of Cruel? And I know, um, was it also filmed outside of Oxford in Ohio? They did a little bit outside of Oxford. They've done some in Ripley. Uh, it's bounced around really to get the aesthetic we need. There's a few scenes in a cabin in a really remote location. Okay. You can go out to Ripley for. And man, I tell you, the drive out to Ripley is a blast. You see stuff that you wouldn't believe. Like there's a whole community on a man made lake that's just people that live in houseboats full time. And you drive past it on the way to this cabin. I'm like, man, that's that would be interesting to film that too. Like you, you don't see that a whole lot. No, you don't. People just 100 percent living on houseboats. And I had to wonder, like, what do they do in the winter when it freezes over? But never did get the answer. Um, I, I've been working on that one for about two months. Okay. And they've done they've done four solid weeks of filming, and I'm only on set for about half of that. I've got one day left at the cabin. And man, I can tell you, there's some fast-paced stuff in this. We got we got fight choreography on lock. Um, nice. There's one scene, and I'll just go ahead and tell people now, so that way we can say <laughs> we're we're doing a fight between myself and the other male lead, and we're in a storage facility. Well, mm-hmm. fortunately, the owner was going to remodel anyway because I go down a little too hard, and my back hits this wall that must have been made of like stucco that's a quarter of an inch thick. So I go into the wall. 
Naeem gets the ter- horrified look on his face, calls cut, and I'm like, well, if you don't use that one, I think we're going to be sad. You know, it, it, it was one of those things where we ended up going through it five or six times, and you just know the good ones when, when you get them. And fortunately, the owner was like, yep, that's a big hole. It's a good thing I'm knocking that wall out anyway, so... Oh, you got lucky then if he's taking that hole out. But if you made that hole, I could just see that owner going, oh, my. um, um." (laughs) We all look horrified, and the owner's just got this knowing look on his face. He's like, well, good thing the the renovators are here in two weeks anyway. And I'm like, oh. So, yeah. So um, did you... So did you go to uh, school uh, to uh, become an actor and get into films? Uh, Not originally, but I actually am in school now. I'm a student at Miami, uh, dual major in acting and zoology, which is my other passion. I worked with one of Ohio State's herpetologists in high school for years doing a study on Massasauga rattlesnakes. Oh, interesting. So you kind of you got the acting bug and you also got the zoologist bug, too. So what got you into the interest of zoology and, you know, studying like snakes? I was fascinated with zoology from a from a really young age. I think one of the first words I can remember myself saying was shark. Uh, I, I wanted to be a marine biologist the whole way through elementary school. And when I got to middle school, there was a bio teacher who was like, hey, have you considered herpetology? And not knowing the root Latin of the word, I'm like, no, I don't want herpes. He's, no, herpetology. <laughs> he shows you that amphibians and reptiles. And at that point, we, you know, I had done stuff with with pretty much every other, you know, animal breed on the planet. And I hadn't worked with reptiles all that much. Well, after a while, it sort of just became second nature to me. Like you'd have tiger salamanders that I'd noticed had a personality. Yeah. Uh, you'd know which, which snakes were the dangerous ones that were going to, you know, have a temperament to try and bite you. And which yeah. ones just sitting there waiting to, to curl up and use your body for warmth. Like, they have more personality than you'd think. And, and I think that ultimately is what stuck with me. On that half of my passions. That's pretty cool. And I bet the next thing, though, you'll probably get into cryptology and go <laughs> study some, uh, you know, paranormal cryptology type of stuff. I've, I've got a, uh, a group of friends that does cryptid hunting out in Pennsylvania. And okay. actually affiliated with, uh, with a television studio out, out there. So they did sort of a reality show hunting for Mothman in Pennsylvania, Big, Bigfoot, and stuff like that. I don't know that they'd ever found anything, but there are certainly some really creepy noises in the Pennsylvania forest in the middle of the night, I can tell you that. I bet. Um, there's a lot of creepiness out here in Ohio, um, especially the dog man. Oh, yeah. I've heard about that. I haven't gotten to catch a glimpse or anything, but that'd be cool. Oh, I haven't um, I haven't got a glimpse at it, um, you know, as well. I mean, it'd be kind, it'd be kind of interesting, you know. This, you know, see something like that, and you'll be like, huh, that's kind of like, <laughs> you just have that little no one thought. ever going to believe me, yeah. Oh, and you also did a little bit of directing a little bit. Um, we talked about, can you uh, tell me a little bit about it, about this little show you directed? Yeah, we did a mini series that unfortunately sort of fell flat. We're actually looking to revive it, but you didn't hear it from me. Um, we're going to convert it from a six episode miniseries into a full feature film. It's called it's the end. Okay. Uh, very much a biblical fantasy story in the vein of supernatural. It starts out uh, the opening scene. that's already been released to the public. You could probably still watch it. If not, I'll send you a link. Um, it's Adam who's been made immortal for his mistakes, for his trans- transgressions. He's sitting in a bar drinking and Lucifer shows up to inform him that God's wrapping things up. The end of the world has come. Make your preparations. And as an immortal, He's kind of faced with the whole, wow, what's left for me if I don't get to go up or down? And this is this is over. So you get seven to eight episodes of solid um, identity crisis, existential peril, the terror of what's left if I literally can't die, and some awesome some awesome supernatural references. Like you get uh, you get Lucifer and Michael having some really great dialogue about you know who's dad's favorite, that kind of thing. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to bringing it back because it was cleverly written. I had a lot of help from my wife with it. I had help with a couple of other creatives. Um, unfortunately, we just lost steam, and it's it's like that when you're doing a TV show as opposed to a movie. So that's one of the main reasons that I'm going to convert it to a feature. All right, I'm going to ask you what your thoughts on this is because this is my strong thoughts. I love collecting physical media. I'm a huge movie buff. 
I have a I have a huge library of films. And I know everything's mostly going to streaming, and nowadays everything's going to streaming and not really, really coming out on like on disc anymore. And then if you go to certain places, that it's only like one little dinky shelf, unless you go online and you go to like to the independent, you know, websites like yeah, like Vinegar Syndrome or Shout or Scream Factory or Kino Lorber, all those great things. And it, and it seems like this generation, like you talked about earlier, want to sit at home and watch first run movies and everything on streaming. So, what's your thoughts about um, physical media uh, versus streaming, and how long do you think physical media is still going to be around? Well, that's a, a good and unfortunately depressing question. I, I'm like you; I love having physical media, particularly for titles that I know have rewatch rewatchability um i've got huge collections of dvds blu-rays i've even got vhs it's up in my attic that i refuse to get rid of like there's absolutely no reason why i would ever see myself part with those and it's sad because when new titles come out in this era you immediately think okay well i want to add this to my collection a good example is like marvel studios work uh back in the time of like 2017 2018 when age of ultron dropped they were still doing dvds and blu-rays with a more regular degree of reliability but now, if you wanted to get a, a DVD of, say, Wakanda Forever when it finally comes out, you're going to be looking for weeks if you find it at all. And while I've always tried uh, on projects of a respectable length to go through some of those distributors that you mentioned and get physical media out there, at least even in my hands, so that they can buy it from me, um, a lot of people don't want to make the investment. And it's unfortunate. I don't think physical media is going to continue for much longer, especially if streaming become you know continues to, to grow the way it has. Almost every studio is putting out its own streaming service, and now with the inclusion of ads, I don't really know what the difference between that and watching TV is. You've got commercials, you've got the same the same run times, just the lack of physical media and a little more control over what's on. That's the only difference in my in my opinion. And also, plus when you watch stuff like on streaming, like the movies you love that you have this, sometimes they may like cut certain things out, or you know cut it for time, and you know, and if you don't really know that movie real well, you're not going to notice which version you're going to watch. And and the bad thing about streaming, I mean, streaming's good. I like to watch streaming too, but. You know, what happened, there's like a movie, it's like, you know, I like this movie, it's still on here, and you decide to pick a day to finally watch it, and then boom, it's not there anymore. Yeah, and they, they do that with whole episodes of TV shows, too. Like, uh, if you ever saw Community, one of the finest examples of a modern sitcom, in my opinion, they were doing a Dungeons & Dragons episode where Ken Jeong dresses yep. up as a dark elf. And you can't find that episode anywhere because people think it's blackface. While I'm 100% anti-racist, all it really takes is to glance at any of my social media to know where I stand on that. I don't really know that I agree with crushing that episode the way they have, because it's obviously true black and not meant to simulate melanin. And there's decades of source material. Having met Gary Gygax personally, I know there are years and years of source material for that. It just makes me sad because otherwise it's a perfectly good episode. I, I think so too. And I have the whole community series in my library, so um, which I'm happy because it's a it's a great brilliant show. You know, I, I always loved it. You know, I loved all the geek references to it. But yeah, it, that's just crazy how it is. And then you talk to other people, you know, that like download all the their movies onto their you know computer, hundreds and hundreds of movies. Okay, you do that, but what happened if there's like a technical glitch in your equipment? And you spend all this money in download, and all of a sudden you lose everything. What do you do from there? Back up your hard drive is the best bet. But at the same time, I spent way too long doing IT professionally to ever trust it. Like uh, when streaming started up, and you couldn't, you had to pay thirteen different subscriptions to get all yeah. the stuff you'd watch on a regular basis. I spun up my own Plex server, which is essentially turning a computer into a broadcaster for whatever media you're holding on there. So it's essentially your own streaming service yeah. that you can then give people codes to and they can yeah. log into the app. So I've had that for a while, but at the same time, you're, you're right. One glitch, one high powered magnet too close to a hard drive, one kid with a glass of juice, not paying attention. And your whole library is gone. Yeah. That's I'm like you. That's why I love my physical, uh, you know, media. I love my library. I don't care 
I got tons of movies, you know, I may not have room for it, but I'm going to still build them and build them until, you know, this like, you know, disappear, I mean, for a little bit. And then next thing you know, we'll probably come back like vinyl records did and, you know, you know, it's like nostalgia, nostalgia, but yeah, I'm like you, I have, I have some VHS and also beta tapes too. Nice. I don't have any of those. I, I miss that boat. I'm 1990, but at the same time, I came out in the height of the of VHS. Nostalgia. Yeah. My parents had them, but they had already got rid of the player. So I'm like, what are these? Just kind of looking at them, never got a chance to use them. Well, actually, Beta was supposed to have been the next big thing before VHS. But Really? Yes. Um, you can look that up. Um, it was like the real popular thing, but people just seemed to latch on to VHS more, so they went focused more on you know VHS. But beta tapes were like really good because you know they had you know the the high resolution and everything compared to a VHS tape. And um, the cool thing about beta um, <coughs> tapes are uh, uh, news uh, news channels and news studios. That's all they use is beta tapes. I do, I do remember that. A friend of mine works at the, out in Youngstown for a news station, J.D. Krause, who's a prominent editor that came out of Cincinnati. He's he's like, I haven't seen betas in like 20 years. <laughs> whatever works. Hey, hey, you know, whatever works for me too, which <laughs> is pretty great. And, you know, you're saying you don't have room you, you don't have room for the physical collection. That's decor as much as anything else. Like, it may also be entertaining to pop it in and watch it, but you can walk around with your friends and be like, look at all my movies. They're awesome. Oh, yeah, that's and there's like, if, there's like a certain movie I have that's unedited and uncut. I can be like, you know something? I'll just pop that in my player, and I can watch it without not worrying about it mysteriously disappearing. I'll just put it right in the, right into the Blu-ray. <laughs> 100%, yeah, and it's entirety, never worrying about people being offended about a particular section and it's suddenly just vanishing, yeah. <laughs> like, I, there's a lot in the film industry to be offended by, there really is. There's some, there's horrible people wherever you work. It, it's a fact that it, you can't get away from Oh, anywhere you go, he, anywhere you go, you're going to have that people. It's not besides... And, you know, in, you know, filmmaking, it could be like a regular job. I mean, you're not going to get anywhere and all that. So do you think um, independent filmmaking, do you think it's starting to um, be on fire now since, you know, people want to find, you know, films that are more original than, you know, recycled? You think it, do you think it's coming with a comeback or do you think? I think it is. I don't know that on fire is the right way to do to, to put it yet uh-huh. keyword there yet in the wow seven years good lord in the seven years that I've been doing this uh, I can definitely say that the number of views the general interest and the overall quality of indie film has just gone up so it's definitely on the rise but what I'd like to see is we go back to the days where and this did happen for a couple of periods in cinema history where you'd end up having indie productions put on the same tier as SAG productions and measured against each other for quality, worth, etc. Um, as technology improves, I think the union's going to become more more just safeguarding the rights of actors and crew and keeping everybody safe or avoiding situations that are unsafe on set. I don't think that production value is predicated on budget anymore and that is going to lead to an indie film's renaissance and i'm excited to be here for it i'm looking forward to you know um it's going to be neat um neat because there's a lot of great you know writers and filmmakers in the indie scene i mean um i'm getting more into it now you know because you know i started going to film festivals and you know meeting some great people and um another great indie filmmaker i really enjoy i love all of his movies is uh Tori Jones. Yes, Tori, though, he does some good work. I haven't gotten to work with him yet, but we are friends, um, chat periodically. He's on the other end of Ohio, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Like Cleveland or Columbus. And we've we've talked. It's just the schedules have never aligned. Like, uh, even with Rise of Elsie Matthews, I had been aware of uh, Vince Hobart Smith as an actor for several years. He actually lives two streets over from me. I could go into my backyard, throw an apple, and hit his roof. <laughs> and we had we hadn't worked prior to Rise of Elsie Matthews. That was our first scene together. So like it's it's amazing how 
easy it is to be aware of all these people for years at a time to love their work and then never cross paths with them until five or six years later. Yeah. It's, I hope to, but Tori does, does wonderful work. Especially Vince Hobart Smith. Um, I think he's phenomenal. Um, I think he's an underrated, uh, actor. Um, he's just really good on what he does. I mean, he's just got that, that unique, this persona about him when you watch him on the screen you can tell whatever character or whatever he does you can tell you know he really puts his you know 100 percent into it all of it he's he's a phenomenal talent he and i have requested from multiple directors to somebody write a buddy cop film for for he and i so that we can do it the the other thing i'd love to see him do is step outside his comfort zone and play a villain most of his characters are the, just these heartwarming altruistic father figures that are just they're wonderful but at the same time i think he's got the potential to go real dark if he put himself into it and, and i'd love to see him try and step out and, and do that villain role but i like i to, enjoy villains though so. I, I like to see him do that um i mean when he did revolver i mean that was kind of a little bit of a little edgy character though True. too it, it looked like you know he stepped out his comfort zone a little bit of you know the character is that's actually that's what made me want to see him do a full fledged villain is that really creepy look that they panned back to at that last frame I'm sure you know which one I'm talking yeah. about yeah that that deeply unsettling look that the actress opposite him even admitted that frightened her in real life I'm like yeah see that right there that's what I want to see show me a, a solid two hours of that and we're gonna have something here but Vince is a great talent regardless of the roles he chooses to take and I'm, I'm excited to work with him more honestly. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to um seeing a little bit more stuff of you too. Um I like short films, you know, a lot of people don't you know realize about short films. There's a lot of great short films out there and people most people just want to see just a full-length film and not a short film. But some of these short films are actually pretty good, you know, they get real known and win awards over in film festivals and 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 eventually they end up becoming full-length anyways. So when I go to a film festival, if there's like a, a feature length film, I'll check it out. But I also like to go see, you know, like the different short films because there's some, you know, good ones out there. I mean, there's some all right ones out there. So there's some that's like, what the heck did I just watch, you know? But short films are just as good. I mean, there's some great short films out there in the indie scene. They serve, honestly, in my mind, as proof of concept. If you end up loving it that much and the audience responds to it in a way that, that really uplifts everybody, you can go back to it and go, all right, let's 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 play around in this world a little more, you know, see if we can't recapture that. I think, though, that ultimately leads to the whole uh, doing sequels to Lightning in the Bottle, like, uh, you know, Hocus Pocus 2 or things like that, that people want to recapture that same, that same feeling. But with indie films, it's easier because everybody's, typically still right there not that much time has passed and you've gone from doing the initial project to getting that feedback to to building the enthusiasm both in your team and in the viewers and then you can dive right back into it not really having lost anything uh after 20 or 30 years going by i I think i'd have trouble stepping back into those same roles you know i'm not the same person anymore so i would do my best of course but whether it would be the same guy or not i'm not that's pretty cool. So where can everybody find you on social media so they know what you're going to be doing next? Well, I deleted my Twitter, but we won't go into that. I'm on uh, Instagram, Facebook, uh, TikTok, and now I actually just joined Hive because a lot of gamers are joining that one. And I'm a huge nerd. So uh, at Detone C, my last name, followed by my first initial, no spaces. And uh, I do follow back, so especially if you're a fellow creator. That's pretty good. I heard about Hive. I'm thinking about checking it out myself. Um, it's it's isn't it kind of like Twitter a little bit? It's an honestly, it, it, to me, feels like the weird hybrid child of Instagram and Twitter. Your post structure and how you post things is very reminiscent of Twitter. But then when you go back to look at your post log, it's got that gallery wall the way Instagram has. And honestly, that was one of my favorite features of Instagram. Anyway, if you're going to have a photo on every every post you may as well be able to see them all lined up there satisfy your ocd whatever (laughs) (laughs) hey thank you so much for coming on it was a blast my pleasure thank you very much for having me i I, I 
I look forward to speaking with you again and hopefully running into you at more premieres. Uh, if you, you def- ever have trouble getting tickets, give me a shout because I, I, I like to make sure that people like, oh. like being around attendance. <laughs> oh.